Act Two of Why Mary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Why Mary by Jessie Lynch Williams. Act Two. It is the next morning, Sunday. It appears that at John's country place they have breakfast at small tables out upon the broad shaded terrace overlooking the glorious view of his little farm. Ernest and Theodore, the scientist and the clergyman, are breakfasting together. The others are either breakfasting in their rooms or are not down yet, it being Sunday. The man of God is enjoying his material blessings heartily. Also he seems to be enjoying his view of the man of science, who eats little and says less. Theodore, with coffee-cup poised. What's the matter with your appetite this morning, Ernest? Ernest, gazing up at one of the second-story windows, does not hear. The door opens. He starts. Then, seeing it's only a servant with food, he sighs. Expecting something? The codfish balls? Well, here they are. Ernest refuses the proffered codfish balls, scowls, brings out cigar-case, lights cigar, looks at watch, and fidgets. Oh, I know, you're crazy to go with me, to church. Ernest doesn't hear, creates a cloud of smoke. Their regular rector is ill, so I agreed to take the service this morning. Always the way when off for a rest, isn't it? No answer. Theodore gets up, walks around the table, and shouts in Ernest's face. Isn't it? I beg your pardon. Oh, you're hopeless. I can't stand people who talk so much at breakfast. Wait a minute. Sit down, have a cigar. Let's talk about God. Theodore stops smiling. But I mean it. I'd like to have a religion myself. I had an idea you took no stock in religion. Takes the cigar. Ernest holds a match for him. Just what I thought until... Well, I've made a discovery. A great discovery. A scientific discovery? Ernest with a wave of the hand. It makes all science look like a mere machine. Well, if you feel so strongly about it, better come to church after all. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about religion. You're not talking about religion. You're talking about love. Certainly. The same thing, isn't it? I'm talking about the divine fire that glorifies life and perpetuates it, the one eternal thing we mortals share with God. If that isn't religious, what is? Theodore smiles indulgently. Tell me, Theodore. You know I wasn't allowed to go to church when young, and since then I've always worked on the Holy Sabbath day, like yourself. Does the church still let innocent human beings think there's something inherently wrong about sex? Theodore drops his eyes, Ernest disgusted with him. I see. Good people should drop their eyes even at the mention of the word. Sex is a necessary evil, I admit, but... <laughs> evil? The God-given impulse which accounts for you sitting there... For me sitting here, the splendid instinct which writes our poetry, builds our civilizations, founds our churches, the very heart and soul of life, is evil. Really, Theodore, I don't know much about religion, but that strikes me as blasphemy against the Creator. Very scientific, my boy, very modern, but the church believed in marriage before science was born. As a compromise with evil? As a sacrament of religion, and so do you. Good. Then why practice and preach marriage as a sacrament of property? Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Women are still goods and chattels to be given or sold, are they? Oh, nonsense. Then why keep on making them promise to serve and obey? Why marry them with a ring, the link of the ancient chain? In the days of physical force it was made of iron, now of gold. But it's still a chain, isn't it? Symbols, my dear fellow, not to be taken in a literal sense. Time-honored and beautiful symbols. But why insult a woman you respect, even symbolically? Oh, you scientists! <laughs> we try to find the truth, and you try to hide it, eh? Well, there's one thing we have in common, anyway. One faith I'll never doubt again. I believe in heaven now. I always shall. Do you mind telling me why, my boy? Not in the least. I've been there. John comes out to breakfast. He is scowling. Good morning. Could you spare me five minutes? John, ringing bell. Haven't had breakfast yet. After breakfast? I've an appointment with young Baker. 
I'll wait my turn. Going to be pretty busy today. You too, I suppose, if you're sailing tomorrow. I can postpone sailing. This is more important. I should hate to see anything interfere with your career. Lucy also arrives for breakfast. She always pours her husband's coffee. I appreciate your interest, but I'll look out for my career. To Lucy. Could you tell me when your sister will be down? John, overriding Lucy. My sister is ill and won't be down at all. Until after you leave. Lucy pretends not to hear. Theodore walks away. Ernest, aroused but calm. I don't believe you quite understand. It is a matter of indifference to me whether we have a talk or not. Entirely out of courtesy to you that I suggested it. Don't inconvenience yourself on my account. Ernest shrugs shoulders and turns to Theodore. Wait. I think I'll sit in church till train time. Come along. I'm going to preach about marriage. Theodore starts off. Ernest, going, turns to Lucy. Thanks for your kindness. Will you ask the valet to pack my things, please? I'll call for them on the way to the station. To John. Do you understand? I have no favors to ask of you. You don't own your sister. She owns herself. The scientist goes to church. John turns to Lucy. Ha, ha, ha! Rather impertinent for a two-thousand-dollar man, I think. Resumes breakfast, picks up newspaper. Lucy says nothing, attending to his wants solicitously. Bah! But what does this highbrow know about the power men of my sort can use when we have to? Lucy cringes dutifully in silence. John, paper in one hand, brusquely passes cup to Lucy with other. Helen got her own way about college, about work, about living in her own apartment. But if she thinks she can put this across, hm, these modern women must learn their place. Lucy, smiling timidly, returns cup. John takes it without thanks, busied in newspapers. A look of resentment creeps over Lucy's pretty face, now that he can't see her. Ah, I've got something up my sleeve for that young woman. Lucy says nothing, looks of contempt while he reads. Well, why don't you say something? I thought you didn't like me to talk at breakfast, dear. Think I like you to sit there like a mummy? No reply. Haven't you anything to say? Apparently not. <sighs> you never have any more, nothing interesting. Does it ever occur to you that I'd like to be diverted? No. Yes. Would you mind very much if, if I left you, John? Left me? When? Where? How long? Now. Any place. Entirely. <laughs> What suddenly put this notion in your head? I'm sorry, John, but I've had it. Oh, for years. I never dared ask you till now. Like to leave me, would you? You have no grounds for divorce, my dear. But you will have, after I leave you. You have no lover to leave with. But couldn't I just desert you, without anything horrid? No money to desert with. You won't let me escape decently, when I tell you I don't want to stay? When I tell you I can't stand being under your roof any longer? When I tell you I'm sick of this life? But you see, I can stand it. I want you to stay. I'm not sick of it. You belong to me. Lucy shrinking away as he approaches. Don't touch me. Every time you come near me, I have to nerve myself to stand it. What's got into you? Don't I give you everything money can buy? My God, if I only gave you something to worry about, if I ran after other women, like old man Baker. If you only would, then you'd let me alone. To me you are repulsive. Taking hold of her. Lucy, you are my wife. Lucy, looking him straight in the eye. But you don't respect me. And I, I hate you. Oh, how I hate you. John holds her fast. I am your husband, your lawful husband. Lucy stops, struggling. Yes, this is lawful. But oh, what laws you men have made for women. The judge comes out, carrying a telegram. Rather early in the day for conjugal embraces, if you should ask me. John and Lucy separate. Makes me quite sentimental and homesick. Judge raises telegram and kisses it. Lucy, 
calming herself. From Aunt Julia again? Do you get telegrams every day from Reno? No, but she caught cold. Went to the theatre last night and caught a cold. So she wired me. Naturally got the habit of telling me her troubles. Can't break it, even in Reno. I thought she hated the theatre. So she does. But I'm fond of it. She went for my sake. She's got the habit of sacrificing herself for me. Just as hard to break good habits as bad. True women enjoy sacrificing themselves. Yes, that's what we tell them. Well, we ought to know. We make them do it. Brings out a fountain pen and sits abruptly. That's what I'll tell her. I can hear her laugh. You know her laugh. Lucy rings for a servant. A telegraph blank? Judge. With a humorous expression he brings a whole pad of telegraph blanks out of another pocket. Carry them with me nowadays. Begins to write. Wish I hadn't sold my Western Union, John. I don't believe you want that divorce very much. It doesn't matter what I want. What she wants is the point. You must give the woman you marry tutti frutti, divorces, everything. Why, I've got the habit myself, and God knows I don't enjoy sacrifice. I'm a man, the superior sex. I don't believe you appreciate that wife of yours. Judge, between the words he's writing. Don't I? It isn't every wife that had travel away out to Reno. You know how she hates travelling. And go to a theatre, and catch a cold, and get a divorce, all for the sake of an uncongenial husband? Suddenly getting an idea, strikes table. I know what gave her a cold. She raised all the windows in her bedroom, for my sake. I always kept them down for her sake. I'll have to scold her. Bends to his writing again. Poor little thing. She doesn't know how to take care of herself without me. I doubt if she ever will. Looks over telegram. A servant comes, takes telegram, and goes. Uncle Everett, I want your advice. John! Do you want a divorce? No, we are not that sort, are we, Lucy? No answer. Are we, dear? No, we're not that sort. We believe in the sanctity of the home, the holiness of marriage. Yes, we believe in the holiness of marriage. Turns away, covering her face with her hands and shuddering. Lucy, tell Helen and Jean to come here. Lucy goes. Well, young Baker spoke to me about Jean last night. I told him I'd think it over and give him my decision this morning. That's right. Mustn't seem too anxious, John. When a properly qualified male offers one of our dependent females a chance at woman's only true career, of course it's up to us to look disappointed. But I didn't bring up the little matter you spoke of. About that chorus girl? Afraid of scaring him off? Not at all, but... Well, it's all over and it's all fixed. No scandal, no blackmail. Hmm. By the way, got anything on Hamilton? I don't believe in saints myself. I see. Good thing. For Jean, Rex isn't a saint. I suppose you'd break off the match. Rex, in riding clothes, comes out. John salutes him warmly. The judge is reading the paper. Rex, not eagerly. Well, well, of course, you realize that you're asking a great deal of me, Rex, but... Offers hand to Rex warmly. Be good to her, my boy. Be good to her. Thanks awfully. See what I mean? Congratulate me, Judge. I'm the happiest of men. So I see. Don't let it worry you. Jean, in riding costume, comes from the house. John, signaling Judge to leave. If Helen asks for me, I'm in the garden. If any telegrams come for me, I'm writing to my wife. Jean and Rex alone. They look at each other, not very lover-like. You weren't in love with me yesterday. You aren't now. You would get out of it if you honorably could, but you honorably can't. So you have spoken to John. You are going to see it through because you are a good sport. I admire you for that, Rex, too much to hold you to it. You are released. Why? Why? You, you don't suppose I want to be released? Well, I do. 
Yesterday I let you propose to me when I cared for someone else. That's not fair to you, to me, to him. Who is he? What do you mean by this? Why didn't you tell me? I am telling you now. What have you ever told me about yourself? You had no right to play fast and loose with me. I'm making the only amends I can. You are free, I tell you. I don't want to be free. He can't have you. You are mine. If you think you can make me stop loving you... Love, Rex, only jealousy. You've never been in love with me. You've always been in love with Helen. But you couldn't get her, so you took me. Isn't that true, Rex? I'll be honest with you, too. Yesterday, I wasn't really very serious. I felt like a brute afterwards. You tried your best to prevent what happened and ran away from me. But now... Don't you know why I ran away? To make you follow. I made you catch me. I made you kiss me. Then you realized that we had been thrown together constantly. Deliberately thrown together, if you care to know it. And, well, that's how many marriages are made. But I shan't marry on such terms. It's indecent. I never thought a woman could be capable of such honesty. Oh, what a bully sport you are. You aren't like the rest that have been shoved at me. Why, I can respect you. You're the one for me. He tries to take her. Jean restraining him with dignity. I'm sorry, Rex, but I am not for you. Jean, without you... Don't you see? I'll, I'll go straight to the devil. That old cowardly dodge? Any man who has no more backbone than that. Why, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man in the world. You won't, eh? We'll see about that. I want you now, as I never wanted anything in my life, and I'll win you from him yet. You'll see. Helen now appears. Oh, I beg your pardon. Lucy said John was out here. I'll call him. She runs down to the garden. I'll call him. He runs after Jean. Helen helplessly watches them go, sighs, standing by the garden steps until John ascends. He looks at Helen a moment, wondering how to begin. She looks so capable and unafraid of him. If you hadn't gone to college, you could have done what Jean is doing. But how proud you must be, John, to have a sister who isn't compelled to marry one man while in love with another. Now, aren't you glad I went to college? <laughs> <laughs> If you think I'd let a sister of mine marry one of old man Baker's $2,000 employees... Why, John, didn't Ernest tell you? Dr. Hawksby has offered him a partnership. Just think of that. What? Going back into private practice? But it's such a fashionable practice. Hawksby made a million at it. But the Institute needs Hamilton. Ah, but we need the money. So you are going to spoil a noble career, are you? That's selfish. I didn't think it of you. There are thousands of successful physicians, but there is only one Ernest Hamilton. <laughs> oh, don't worry, John. He has promised me to keep his $2,000 job. Ah, uh, I'm glad. You must let nothing interfere with his great humanitarian work. Think of what it means to the lives of little children. Think of what it means to the future of the race. Why... Everyone says his greatest usefulness has hardly begun. Oh, I know all that. I've thought of all that. Now such men should be kept free from cares and anxiety. What was it you said yesterday? He needs every cent of his salary for books, travel, all the advantages he simply must have for efficiency. To marry a poor man, most selfish thing a girl could do. Yes, John, that's what I said yesterday. But that was before he asked you. Rather pleased with yourself now, aren't you? Just a woman after all. Heroine of cheap magazine story. Sacrifices career for love. All very pretty and romantic, my dear. But how about the man you love? Want to sacrifice his career too? But I'm not going to sacrifice what you are pleased to call my career. Therefore, he won't have to sacrifice his. What? Going to keep on working? Will he let the woman he loves work? Helen, demure. Well, you see, he says I'm too good to loaf. <laughs> Who'll take care of your home when you're at work? 
Who'll take care of your work when you're at home? Look at it practically. To maintain such a home as he needs on such a salary as he has, why, it would take all your time, all your energy, to keep him in his class, you'll have to drop out of your own, become a household drudge, a servant. And if I'm willing? Then where's your intellectual companionship? How will you help his work? Expense for him, disillusionment for both. If you're the woman you pretend to be, you won't marry that man. The world needs his work, but he needs mine, and we both need each other. And marriage would only handicap his work, ruin yours, and put you apart. You know that's true. You've seen it happen with others. You have told me so yourself. Then that settles it. We must not, cannot, shall not marry. We have no right to marry. I agree with all you say. It would not join us together. It would put us asunder. And you'll give him up? Good, good. Give him up? Never! The right to work, the right to love, those rights are inalienable. No, we'll give up marriage, but not each other. But, but I don't understand. We need each other, in our work and in our life, and we're to have each other, until life is ended and our work is done. Now, do you understand? Are you in your right mind? Think what you're saying. I have thought all night, John. You have shown me how to say it. But, but why? This is utterly unbelievable. Why, I'm not even shocked. Do you, do you notice? I'm not even shocked. Because everything you have said, everything you have done, it all proves that you are a good woman. If I were a bad woman, I'd inveigle him into marriage, John. Inveigle? Marriage? Are you crazy? Oh, this is all one of your highbrow jokes. John, weren't you serious when you said marriage would destroy him? But this would destroy you. Well, even if that were so, which is more important to the world? Which is more important to your great humanitarian work? Ah, very clever. A bluff to gain my consent to marrying him. A trick to get his salary raised. John, nothing you can do, nothing you can say, will ever gain my consent to marrying him. I've not told you half my reasons. My God, my own sister. And did you for one moment dream that I would consent to that? Not for one moment. I'm not asking your consent. I'm just telling you. Ridiculous. If you really meant to run away with this fellow, would you come and tell me, your own brother? Do you suppose I'd run away without telling, even my own brother? Bah! All pose and poppycock. He abruptly touches Bell. I'll soon put a stop to this nonsense. Muttering. Damnedest thing I ever heard of. John, I understand exactly what I'm doing. You never will. But nothing you can do can stop me now. We'll see about that. The butler appears. Ask the others to step out here at once, all except Miss Jean and Mr. Baker. I don't want them. Is Dr. Hamilton about? No, sir. He went to church. All right. The butler disappears. To church. My God. Helen pays no attention. She gazes straight out into the future, head high, eyes clear, and wide open. First of all, when the others come out, I'm going to ask them to look you in the face. Then you can make this statement to them, if you wish, and look them in the face. If I were being forced into such a marriage as poor little Jean's, I would kill myself. But in the eyes of God, who made love, no matter how I may appear in the eyes of men who made marriage, I know that I am doing right. Lucy comes out, followed by the judge. John, not seeing them, he is loud. Say that to Uncle Everett and Cousin Theodore. Say that to my wife. Stand up and say that to the world, if you dare. Lucy, to judge. She has told him. John, wheeling about. What? Did she tell you? Why didn't you come to me at once? She said she wanted to tell you herself. I didn't think she'd dare. They all turn to look at Helen. Theodore comes back from church alone. It had to be announced, of course. Announced? What is announced? All turn to him in a panic. Their engagement, Theodore. Yes, John has given his consent at last. Example to society. 
Of course, one of the finest fellows in the world. And with all he has a deep religious nature. Congratulations. My dear, he'll make an ideal husband. Takes both Helen's hands, about to kiss her. Helen can't help smiling. Thank you, cousin, but I don't want a husband. A sudden silence. Theodore looks from one to the other. A lover's quarrel already? No, Theodore. These lovers are in perfect accord. They both have conscientious scruples against marriage. Conscientious. So they are simply going to set up a housekeeping without the mere formality of a wedding ceremony. Theodore drops Helen's hands. We are going to do nothing of the sort. Uncle Everett. Takes her hands again. We are not going to set up housekeeping at all. He will keep his present quarters and I mine. But they are going to belong to each other. Theodore drops Helen's hands, aghast. I don't believe it. Judge, apart to Theodore. A strike against marriage. It was bound to come. Theodore, to judge. But church and state. Indicates self and judge. Must break this strike. John is a practical man. He will prove to you that such a home as we could afford would only be a stumbling block to Ernest's usefulness, a hollow sphere for mine. You can't fill it with mere happiness, Lucy, not for long, not for long. Judge restrains Theodore, about to reply. Oh, let her get it all nicely talked out. Then she'll take a nap and wake up feeling better. Whispering. We've driven her to this ourselves, but she really doesn't mean a word of it. Come, dear child, tell us all about this nightmare. Why, think what would happen to an eager intellect like Ernest Hamilton's if he had to come back to a narrow-minded apartment or a dreary suburb every evening and eat morbid meals opposite a housewife regaling him with the social ambitions of the other commuters. Ugh! It has ruined enough brilliant men already. Judge restrains Theodore and others who want to interrupt. Now at the university club he dines, at slight expense compared with keeping up a home, upon the best food in the city with some of the best scientists in the country. Marriage would divorce him from all that, would transplant him from an atmosphere of ideas into an atmosphere of worries. We should be forced into the same deadly ruts as the rest of you, uncle. Do you want me to destroy a great career, Theodore? Do you want to be a blot upon that career? I'd rather be a blot than a blight, and that's what I'd be if I became his bride. Ask John. Do you want to be disgraced, despised, ostracized? A choice of evils, dear. Of course, none of those costly, well-kept wives on your visiting list will call upon me. But instead of one day at home, instead of making a tired husband work for me, I'll have all my days free to work with him, like the old-fashioned woman you admire. Instead of being an expense, I'll be a help to him. Instead of being separated by marriage and divergent interests, we'll be united by love and common peril. Isn't that the orthodox way to gain character, Theodore? Oh, this is all damned nonsense. Look here, you've either got to marry this fellow now or else go away and never see him again. Never, never! Just what I thought, John. I intended never to see him again. That was why I let you send me abroad. But I'll never, never do it again. It was perfectly dreadful. Ernest couldn't get along without me at all, poor old thing. And I, why, I nearly died. Then you'll have to be married, that's all. Why, of course, you'll have to, that's all. Oh, I know just how you feel about it. I thought so too, at first. But I can't marry Ernest Hamilton. I love him. But if you love him truly... Marriage, my dear, brings together those who love each other truly. But those who love each other truly don't need anything to bring them together. The difficulty is to keep apart. That's all romantic rot. Everyone feels that way at first. At first? Then the practical object of marriage is not to bring together those who love each other, but to keep together those who do not? To Lucy. What a dreadful thing marriage must be. <coughs> ah! So you wish to be free to separate. Now we have it. To separate? What an idea! On the contrary, we wish to be free to keep together. In the old days, when they had interests in common, 
marriage used to make man and woman one but now it puts them apart can't you see it all about you he goes downtown and works she stays uptown and plays he belongs to the laboring class she belongs to the leisure class at best they seldom work at the same or similar trades legally it may be a union but socially it's a mesalliance in the eyes of god it's often worse no wonder that one in eleven ends in divorce the only way to avoid spiritual separation is to shun legal union like a contagious disease modern marriage is divorce i found my work i found my mate and so has he what more can any human being ask the butler appears dr hamilton is outside in a taxicab sir show him here at once he says he does not care to come in sir unless you are ready to talk to him now well of all the nerve you bet i'm ready starts off helen starts too judge interrupting them calmly wait a minute wait a minute to servant ask dr hamilton kindly to wait in the library the butler goes now we're all a bit overwrought soothes helen pats her hand puts arm about her gradually leads her back i still believe in you helen i still believe in him to all it's simply that he's so deeply absorbed in his great work for mankind that he doesn't realize what he is asking helen to do so i told him when he asked me to marry him what, what? he, he asked, asked you to, to marry him? him of course implored me to marry him so absorbed not in mankind but in me that he didn't realize what he was asking me to do and you refused him the man who loves you honorably of course you don't suppose i take advantage of the poor fellow's weakness women often do i admit even when not in love sometimes not because they're depraved but dependent and then he proposed this wicked substitute poison her innocent mind the bounder but he did nothing of the sort oh your own idea was it of course john to all and he is willing to take advantage of the poor child's ignorance the cad to theodore deep religious nature eh i can't believe it of him he knows nothing about it yet i haven't even seen him since i made my decision all exchange bewildered glances john apart to judge we've got to get him off to paris it's our only hope you can't stop her following she's on the edge of a precipice do you want to shove her over you are dealing with big people here and a big passion the butler returns dr hamilton asks to see miss helen while waiting tell dr hamilton that miss helen will see him here the butler leaves are you crazy we've got to keep em apart our one chance to save her no bring them together that is our one chance come we'll go down into the garden and they'll have a nice little talk nothing like talk john honest talk to clear these marriage problems going and let them elope in that taxicab not on your life runs to and fro come john girls never notify the family in advance when they plan elopements it's not done uncle everett is right ernest will bring her to her senses he has a deep religious nature judge leads john away to the garden lucy lingering to helen if you offer yourself on such terms to the man who loves you honorably he'll never look at you again theodore leading lucy off to garden don't worry she won't Ernest rushes out to Helen. Ernest! At last. He takes her in his arms. She clings to him and gazes into his eyes. A long embrace. Tell me that you're all right again. Except that you deserted me, dear, just when I needed you most. Ernest, Ernest, never leave me again. Deserted you? Why, your brother said you were ill. Ah, I see. He was mistaken but never mind now i've got you at last and i'll never never let you go you've got to sail with me to-morrow together oh think together another embrace are you sure you love me <laughs> am i sure ten million times more to-day than yesterday even so 
it is not and can never be as i love you ernest with her hands and his then you can apologize apologize for saying years and years ago in other words last night that you didn't think you'd marry me after all she starts why what's the matter you're trembling like a leaf you are ill no oh no still a few lingering doubts i had hoped a good night's rest would put those little prejudices to sleep forever sleep she shakes her head gazing at him soberly so you could not sleep neither could i i was too happy to sleep i was afraid i'd miss some wondrous throbbing thought of your loveliness takes her passive hand puts a kiss in it and closes it reverently while she looks into his eyes without moving do you know i'm disappointed in love i always thought it meant soft sighs and pretty speeches it means an agony of longing delicious agony but oh terrific she says nothing dear dear girl it may be easy for you but i can't stand much more of this nor i you must come to paris with me or i'll stay home all through the night i had waking visions of our being parted just when we had found each other at last some terrible impersonal monster stepped in between us and said no now that you have had your glimpse of heaven away ye twain shall not enter here silly wasn't it but i couldn't get the horror of it out of my head do you know why ernest because it was in mine it came from my thought to yours you and i are attuned like wireless instruments even in the old blind days there in the laboratory i used to read your mind shall i tell you the name of the monster that would put us asunder its name is marriage but i need you you know that and you need me it's too late we are helpless now in the clutch of forces more potent than our little selves forces that brought us into the world forces that have made the world whether you will or no this beautiful binding power is sweeping you and me together and you must yield helen reaching for his hand ah my dear could anything make it more beautiful more binding than it is now it is perfect the one divine thing we share with god the church is right in that respect i used to look upon marriage as a mere contract it's a religious sacrament does the wedding ceremony make it sacred that medieval incantation no love which is given by god not the artificial form made by man i knew it i knew you'd see it the mistake of all the ages they've tried to make love fit marriage it can't be done marriage must be changed to fit love yes i'll go to paris with you you darling but not as your wife you mean without marriage i mean without marriage a moment ago i thought i loved you as much as a man could love woman i was mistaken in you i was mistaken in myself for now i love you as man never loved before you superb you wonderful woman helen holds out her hand to be shaken not caressed then you agree ernest kneels kisses her hand and arises of course not you blessed girl don't you suppose i understand it's all for my sake therefore for your sake no then for my sake for the sake of everything our love stands for <laughs> do you think i'd let you do anything for anybody's sake you're sure later to regret then don't ask me to marry you ernest we'd both regret that later it would destroy the two things that have brought us together love and work nonsense nothing could do that and besides think of our poor horrified families think of the world's view aren't we sacrificing enough for the world money comforts even children must we also sacrifice each other to the world must we be hypocrites because others are must we too be cowards and take on the protective coloring of our species our ideas may be higher than society's but society rewards and punishes its members according to its own ideas not ours do you want society's rewards do you fear society's punishment with you in my arms i want nothing from heaven i fear nothing from hell but my dear consider the price consider the price aren't you willing to pay the price i yes but it's the woman 
always the woman who pays i am willing to pay i am not willing to let you you'll have to be dear i shall go with you on my terms or not at all you will come with me as my wife or stay at home now after all i've said all i've done ernest i've told the family i've relied upon you i took for granted ernest you wouldn't you couldn't leave me behind now thanks to you and what you've made of me i must and i will ernest opens her arms to him to take her ernest about to enfold her resists no if you love me enough for that points to her pleading hands i love you enough for this he turns to go come when you're ready to marry me do you think this has been easy for me do you think i'll offer myself again on any terms never you must marry me and you will you don't know me good-bye very well ernest afraid to stay goes at once she waits motionless until she hears the automobile carrying him away she immediately turns from stone to tears with a low wail in utter despair hands outstretched she sinks down upon a bench and buries her face in her hands oh ernest how could you lucy theodore judge and john all hurry back all excited did you see his horrified look fairly running away revolted ah points at helen helen arises defiant confident calm what did i tell you you have thrown away the love of an honorable man trampled upon the finest feelings of a deep nature let this be a lesson to you you've lost your chance to marry your chance to work and now by heavens you will cut out independence and stay at home where women belong and live down this disgrace if you can with one excuse or another he'll stay away he'll never come back he will he is coming now he is crossing the hall he is passing through the library he's here but she doesn't turn ernest reappears at the door and takes in the situation at a glance he'll never look at you again and i don't blame him i'm a man i know we don't respect women who sell out so cheap you lie all turn astounded helen runs toward ernest with a cry of joy john starts to block her to john stop you're not fit to touch her no man is Humph. i suppose that's why you ran away yes to protect her from myself then why come back to protect her from you you cowards you hypocrites he rushes down to helen puts his strong arm about shoulder and whispers rapidly just as i started something stopped me in a flash i saw all this helen clasping his arm with both hands i made you come i made you see john advances menacingly by what right are you here in my home by what right do you take my sister in your arms by a right more ancient than man-made law i have come to the cry of my mate i'm here to fight for the woman i love my trip to Paris is postponed. One week from today, gather all your family here, and in your home we'll make our declaration to the world. In my home? Ha! <laughs> Not if I know it. Judge, restraining John. Play for time, John. He'll bring her round. John, to Ernest. Do you mean to marry her or not? Speak my language! Ernest releases Helen and steps across to John. She decides that not you all turn to helen never you'll go with this damned fanatic only over my dead body and that will only cry aloud the thing you wish to hide from the world you fear just now jean is seen slowly returning from the garden without rex her pretty head is bent and busy with her own sad thoughts she is startled by the following there are laws to prevent marriage in some cases but none to enforce marriage on women unless they will it enforce do you think i'll ever allow a sister of mine to marry a libertine jean thinks they are discussing her and is outraged but i'm not going to marry him my engagement is broken general consternation sobbing jean runs into house 
My God, what next? Lucy, don't let Rex get away. You know what he'll do, and when he sobers up, it may be too late. Too earnest. As for you, you snake, you get right out of here. Judge, in the sudden silence. Now you've done it, John. Oh, very well. This is your property. But I am not. I go too. She runs to Ernest. Don't commit this sin. Let her go. She's no sister of mine. If she leaves this house now, it's all up. A woman who will give herself to a man without marriage is no sister of mine. Give? But if I sold myself, as you are forcing poor little Jean to do, to a libertine she does not love, who does not love her, that is not sin. That is respectability. To urge and aid her to entrap a man into marriage by playing the shameless tricks of the only trade men want women to learn, that is holy matrimony. But to give yourself of your own free will to the man you love and trust and can help, the man who loves and needs and has won the right to have you, oh, if this is sin, then let me live and die a sinner. She turns to Ernest, gives him a look of complete love and trust, then bursts into tears upon his shoulder, his arms enfolding her protectingly. End of Act Two